So here's a question for you. If you find a $5 beat up case like I did with this one at eWaste, is it worth salvaging the components inside? We're gonna find out today on the Retro Hack Shack. All right, well, here's a little bit of a backstory on this. I was just going along having a hey old time taking apart this computer that I got from eways. The case was super messed up and wasn't worth salvaging at all, but the guts looked pretty interesting. So I was taking it apart basically just to salvage some parts. And I thought, you know what? This thing might actually work. So I've already disassembled it. I've brought the case, which was really beat up. It had duct tape all over it. It wasn't worth saving or cleaning. Uh, nothing particularly special about it. So I took the case back to eWaste and I still have all these components. So I thought, let's go ahead and make a video and just see if this thing will actually boot up and work and see if there's any repairs needed. Um, so let's just go over what I found when I took this apart. And first, let's talk about the motherboard. The cool thing about this motherboard is it's a Socket 7 motherboard, which means it's good for uh, early, early-ish Pentiums, meaning like Pentium 1, I think. I can't remember. I think after that, they Pentium 2 had the slot um, uh, type processor. So I think this is good for maybe 486s and Pentium class um, CPUs. Definitely Pentium class. Anyway, um, the cool thing about this, though, is it has these uh, ISA slots here, and it has PCI slots, and it even has an extended PCI slot. Hey, future Aaron here. Just a correction while I was editing, I realized that this is actually an Asus Media Bus. It was a proprietary computer bus developed by Asus. It was developed to provide a cost-effective solution to a complete multimedia system, and it only lasted a few years. So this could be used for a number of things. And I think it's a really good example of a motherboard that uh, from this time period. Now I looked it up and I do have the manual for it. So that will definitely help. I've saved that away. Um, and it came with a full complement of memory over here. So I haven't looked at this yet. We'll have to see how much is installed here. But yeah, this memory will come in handy. Anytime I see a motherboard that has the memory still installed, you know, I try to scoop that up because you're almost guaranteed that this memory was working at some point in the in the motherboard. So you know you've got the right type and everything. It just kind of makes the process a lot easier. But this is an old school motherboard. You can see down here, we've got uh, two IDE uh, connectors there and a floppy connector. We've got serial connectors in the back. So this is the time period where stuff was being built into these motherboards. Um, so you didn't have to add separate cards for them, which is really nice. And then it also came with the CPU. This is an Intel Pentium 200 MMX CPU. One thing I will say about this is when I got it, someone had already taken it out of the socket and it had bent pins all over the place. So I spent a good hour and a half, two hours straightening pins. They have to be exactly uh, straight in order to go in this socket. And that is a pain in the butt if you've never done it. So I spared you all of that uh, <laughs> a montage, <laughs> pin straightening montage. I don't think anyone wants to see that. Um, and then down here, it does have a Dallas um, real-time clock, no CMOS battery. So the CMOS is going to be um, um, the CMOS memory anyway is going to be here and it's going to be powered by a battery that has probably gone bad, but let's just see if this thing boots. And uh, if we have to, we'll come back and deal with this Dallas uh, real-time clock chip. In terms of peripherals, I was happy to see this Diamond uh, Stealth video card. It's a Diamond Stealth version 1.01. You can see right here on the firmware. They were kind of a staple for the type of video card that you would have in your PC, um, especially if you were building your own PC around this time period. Next up, we have kind of a bog standard US Robotics modem with the tinny speaker that we all remember hearing that uh, familiar modem sound with when we would dial up. Uh, AOL or some other service, and it has the jumpers for configuring IRQs and COM ports down here. I remember setting these up at work all the time. And uh, yeah, they didn't seem to fail. I'm sure it still works, but probably won't be able to use it really, unless we really wanted to go down memory lane and, and uh, hack something together just for the nostalgia of hearing that sound go off again. Next up, there is an Ethernet card here. So again, this is a kind of, it looks like a cheapo, no name Ethernet card. I couldn't find a brand on it anyway. Maybe you can see one at home, but 
Yeah, this card would have been um, put in a lot of these PCs, especially if they were used around the office. Probably 10-100 is what I'm guessing, uh, but we probably won't be using it today. And last but not least is this Sound Blaster Aw32 CT2760. So this is actually an ISA Sound Blaster card, which is really cool. It has all the uh, the requisite ports here for connecting uh, different uh, CD, CD-ROM drives and things like that. Very long card. Of course, this, these became ubiquitous as well. Um, has the option for adding some 30 pin memory up here for some sort of cache or something. But uh, yeah, I love seeing these old Sound Blaster cards. So we'll definitely have to see if we can get this one working. In terms of a hard drive, the hard drive was included with this system. A lot of times people will take these out even for older systems, but I was glad to see this in here because if it's working, we might be able to see what this uh, particular user was using this uh, PC for. This is an 8.455 megabyte, so 8.5 gigabyte hard drive, very typical of the time, and it's a Western Digital Caviar drive. Also a TIAC uh, floppy drive, which will definitely come in handy and also an Access Tech CD-ROM. It's a uh, CD-RW, CDR, CD-RW drive um, that I supported, that supported 32 speed reading and I think uh, uh, eight speed writing or 12 speed, speed writing. And uh, so this was also nice to have. We'll have to see if this works, but uh, yeah, certainly at this time, people would have been adding these. They were becoming, uh, as you can tell by the brand name, um, more commodities in the market. Prices were going down. So it was really easy to pick one of these up and add it to your system after the fact, even if you've been using your PC for a few years. And this is an AT motherboard, so uh, no soft power switch for us. We actually have a bulky um, actual switch that's switching the mains power, so need to be a little careful here. But anyway, we'll be using that. It's a, I think 250 watt, it says right here on top, 250 watt power supply, so that should be enough for everything we need. And I also saved the little seven segment display that shows the, um, you typically it would show the clock speed of the processor, although this one starts with a one. So maybe I can key this to be 199 <laughs> or something like that, because this is a 200 megahertz processor. So this isn't gonna be real helpful here, but uh, I wanted to save it anyway, just in case I needed one as a replacement for another system. Okay, now I've talked about this before, um, on some of my older PCs that I've repaired and restored. But this one, uh, I did go ahead and test the power supply by hooking it up to the hard drive, nothing else connected, uh, so that there can be some load on the system, so the power supply will start. Tested the rails, and the rails look good. The rails were actually perfect, 12 volts, and uh, like 5.01 or 5.05 volts, something like that. So really good voltage. It looks like the power supply is still working for now. We'll see if any magic smoke escapes as we uh, use it and test it out here. I've also already tested the rails on the motherboard while I had the power supply disconnected because there are some tantalum caps on the cards and also on the, uh, the board itself. So I went ahead and tested everything just to make sure that the rails looked good and they did. So, so far, I think things are in good shape or as good as they can be as long as my pin straightening didn't damage anything on the processor and as long as the cards work and everything else. So I went ahead and hooked up an old keyboard and I think we're ready to turn this on for its first test. I went ahead and connected, by the way, the all the, all the peripherals as well. So I've got the CD-ROM connected, the floppy drive connected, hard drive connected. Normally I wouldn't do that, but I have a good uh, feeling that, that those are probably working. So I think we just need to power this on now and see what happens. All right, here we go. Oh, something's rattling. The fan is working, obviously, here on the processor. Let's see if we get anything on the screen. So far, nothing. Not even the hard drive spinning. Oh, it's because I didn't hook up the power, duh. I hooked up the... Uh, the floppy and IDE cables, but didn't actually hook up the power. Okay, I'll be right back. Ah, there we go. The little display is working. Looks like the CD-ROM kind of clicked on. The hard drive I can hear spinning. Still not getting a display. Ah, hard drive cable is turned around 180 degrees. I swear we'll get this going here. Try it one more time. Oh, I got a post beep. There we go. 
Plug and play cards. Ward BIOS from 1995, that makes sense given the age of everything on here. Check some error. CMOS battery failed. Press F1 to continue or delete to setup. So let's go ahead and go to setup and see what this is configured for. See if it sees everything. So I know that it detected the hard drive already, or at least it looked like it did. It's got almost the right date in here, actually. February 13th, 2022. I'm surprised that that's working at all without the clock. Uh, that may change as we reboot this. We'll see. But everything's set to auto. Um, it's set for a 1.44 meg floppy drive. And uh, yeah, it looks good. Video, EGA, VGA. So this all looks pretty good. I'm sure that the BIOS has, um, that this is the default setup for the BIOS. Um, so we've got boot sequence C to A. Yeah, everything here looks pretty standard, pretty good. It's obviously getting to the BIOS. So let's go ahead and exit out of this and just see if this thing actually boots. I'm just gonna go ahead and save the settings. I, I'm not sure how the Dallas chip actually works in terms of whether, if I think if this has no memory, or sorry, no battery left in it, it doesn't matter what I do here. I don't think it's gonna save any of these settings, but let's just try to save it anyway and see what happens. This time I'll hit F1 to continue. Oh, here we go, Microsoft Windows 2000. Cool, let's see if it's actually working. At least the hard drive appears to be working. And here we go, Microsoft Windows 2000 Professional built on NT technology. Um, yeah, I was an MCSE back in the day, so I had to learn all about NT and networking and all that kind of stuff. So this would have been around the time when I was doing that training probably. Um, not a big fan of Windows 2000, but maybe from a corporate perspective, if this was used at a corporation somewhere, maybe that was why they chose Windows 2000. I don't know. Uh, ooh, some uh, little display. I don't know if that's the display or maybe getting some interference here. Control to delete to log in. So Windows 2000 uh, came out, of course, after NT. NT, by the way, a little bit of trivia for those who might not remember. Uh, NT stood for New Technology. Um, and it was quite a departure, really, for Microsoft to go to NT, different uh, kernel, I believe. I'm not a Microsoft insider or anything, but uh, quite a different uh, type of technology. And, of course, that led to all of the newer operating systems after Windows 95, 98, etc. cetera. Um, you know, this, this kind of uh, bled into the newer um, operating systems like uh, XP and uh, all the later ones as well, kind of owe their heritage to NT. So it's old technology now, but originally it stood for new technology. And I love this because it's redundant. Built on NT technology, so new technology technology. Well, I can hear the hard drive still processing stuff. It's still booting some things. But let's just go ahead and hit Control-Alt-Delete and see if we can log in here. Uh, apparently this belonged to someone named Joanne, uh, who has a password. Let's see if the password is blank. Used to be able to log in with a blank password on... Um, uh, like uh, 95 and 98, they would let you just bypass this essentially or, or cancel out. Oh, and look, it's trying to log into a domain. I don't have a mouse set up, but um, okay, there, we can change it to this computer. And what happens if we do cancel? Uh, it just goes back. We used to, used to be able to cancel out of this. I am kind of curious what's on this hard drive. Okay, so it looks like Joanne actually does have a password. Uh, we could probably crack it, but I think what I want to do is just see what's on the hard drive. So it depends on if this hard drive is formatted to a FAT partition type or NTFS. NT, of course, came from new technology or Windows NT as well. as a new NT, uh, stands for NT file system. So, yeah, let me see if we can just boot this up off a of floppy or something and at least see what format the partition is on the hard drive. So the other thing is that it won't boot off a of floppy, and I think that's because of the BIOS settings. The problem is when I go to change this, now I've changed it to A first and then C. And if I do F10, whoops, I need to hit escape first. If I do F10, save and exit, it just boots off the C drive again. It doesn't actually boot the A drive. So if we go back in here and look... Now, I haven't powered this down. I've just been doing soft reboots, right? But if we go back in here and look at the BIOS, look what happens. It's not remembering the settings. And I think the reason is because of this Dallas chip. These Dallas chips, uh, you know, this thing's quite old. 
and the battery inside, there's battery and memory inside. The memory holds the CMOS settings and the, ba the battery keeps the CMOS memory chip powered on so that it can retain those BIOS settings, the CMOS settings. And the problem is, is that this, this chip, the, the battery goes dead and then it won't retain the BIOS settings at all anymore. So I think I've never tried this before, but I think I'll try a little surgery on this Dallas chip and see if we can reinvigorate it with an additional uh, battery that we can add to it and get this thing up and running to see what's on this hard drive. All right, so here is that Dallas chip out of the motherboard. And you can see down here, there's a date code. This was manufactured 1996, second week. So as I said, this package contains a real-time clock chip, a little bit of memory and a battery, and a, there's actually a, uh, a clock in there, a crystal that runs to keep everything running on the right time. And um, that battery is now dead. And you can kind of see what they've done here. If I turn this over, perhaps you can see on the back, this is essentially the, the IC here. Um, and it's encased in this outer casing that they've potted and they've clipped off some of the pins as well. So here's the data sheet uh, pin assignment. You can see that they have the address lines here. Uh, there's VCC and then you can see these pins over here that are listed as no connection, but there is a chip underneath. And what they've done is they've cut off these pins that say no connection here, but in actuality, People have taken these apart and they know what's what these pins are that say no connection. They know what those actually are. And one of them, pin 20 here, is the positive voltage or the positive side of the battery um, that's inside. So if we tap into that connection there where it says no connection um, and then connect the other side of the battery to a ground pin, which is right over here on 12, we can actually provide the voltage needed to get this chip to run again. And this is documented in several places around the internet. You can find uh, drawings and things. And here you can see, uh, sure enough, this is this connection right here. Whoops. Yeah, that connection right there is where we need to connect a positive side of a three volt or three voltish um, battery in order to get this to work. And the way we can do that is we can use a Dremel or some other tool here to uh, cut away this plastic material right here where this pin is underneath. They cut that off above where the potting compound is so you can't get to it from the bottom. You have to take away some of this plastic material in order to get to that pin that's buried underneath this plastic. And then we can solder a wire onto that, uh, onto a battery, and we should be good to go. Okay, well there you can see, that's the uh, little slot I've drilled. And I just went really, really slow and took my time until I could start to see that metal, uh, you can see the little metal um, part of the pin there that I exposed. So that's where I'm going to solder on the positive terminal for the battery. Like I said, negative terminal will just go on to the regular ground pin after I solder the chip back into the board. And here's what it looks like with the uh, battery terminal soldered in. I did this so the, so the wire wouldn't get away of the uh, chip seating down properly to the motherboard. And like I say, once it's in there, then I will just take the other black wire down there, connect it to the ground pin. Also, the wires on this are long enough, plenty long, so that I can uh, reach around underneath the motherboard to get to that ground pin from the other side. Okay, so the battery has been soldered back in, both the positive and negative sides of the uh, the new battery, the extended battery, are in place. Uh, one final note, or two final notes, uh, the nice thing about these little battery holders, I only have one battery in this one, even though it takes two, um, so we've got three volts here. But the nice thing is they do have an on-off switch, so if you wanted to store this computer away for a while and you didn't want the battery to drain out, you can just hit the off button. Of course, you will have to reprogram your CMOS, but as we saw earlier, it should be pretty easy to do for most common setups. The other point I wanted to make, and you may be thinking this, is that there, the battery on the inside is still connected. So essentially what we're doing here um, is we are charging up the battery or applying power to the battery on the inside of the Dallas chip with the new battery that we just connected. And while that's true, um, most of the information I've been able to find on the internet where people have done this have said that it only causes a minor bit of um, 
reduced battery life by doing it this way. And again, because I have the on off switch, I'm not too worried about that, but we'll see over time. If I find out that this battery drains right away, I will come back and do an update. All right, so let's switch this on and see if this will remember some updated BIOS settings. All right, so now it says it's uh, March 13th, 2022, which is not correct. So I'm going to update this to Friday, September um, 23rd, which is what it is right now as I'm recording this. BIOS features, and I want this to be A and then C in the boot sequence. Boot up floppy seek, I think I want that enabled. Let's see what that does. Again, back out, let's save our settings and see if it remembers them. Oh, it did because, yep, it's actually booting off the floppy. <laughs> so it definitely remembered the settings um, because it was not able to boot off the floppy before uh, I made that change. So now, uh, I've got, this is a boot up floppy that has the uh, CD-ROM drivers already loaded on it for various CDs. It'll try to try to boot uh, uh, some generic CD-ROM drivers. And sure enough, we have a CD-ROM at drive R and I should be able to go to the C drive. Uh oh, nope. Invalid drive specification. So here we are in F disk. If I display the partition information, it says HPFS um, and DOS is certainly not going to be able to see that, but Perhaps with a CD-ROM, working CD-ROM drive and a floppy drive, it might be possible to boot up a Linux CD and then see if I can see what information is on that drive. Okay, so I've got a couple tools now at my disposal that I've just created. One is this floppy disk. And uh, this uh, particular disk is not expenses.xls. I did look this up. It's just a Excel uh, template for someone to do their expenses with. But what I did was I burned a copy of uh, a tool called All-in-One Boot Floppy. You can find this out on the internet. And what it does is it allows for systems like this that typically can't boot off of a CD directly to be able to boot off of a CD. So this, and it has a lot of other tools too, including, I think, the ability to read NTFS file systems and look at the files in read-only mode. So if nothing else, we can use this to look at the files. Um, I've also installed some additional memory back here, so we should have 80 megabytes of memory or so uh, if those uh, memory sims are now working again after I clean them off. And then I also burned a CD, which is over there, uh, which is a tiny core CD, except this is not tiny core, it's actually core, just core, because that's supposed to run in 16 meg of RAM, so it should load a live disk of Linux in 16 meg of RAM. So if for some reason the uh, this doesn't work, maybe that'll work and uh, might try that out anyway, just to see if it runs on this old hardware. Here we go, I heard a single beep. That means, yep, we've got 82 megs of RAM now. So that's really nice to see. That'll be helpful. And it is booting off the floppy, loading Grub which if you don't know, Grub is a uh, bootloader for Linux and it's really super useful. Um, I, won't go, I won't go into any more detail. <laughs> you can look up Grub on Wikipedia if you wanna know more about what it is. This video is not long enough to go over that. Um, but here we go, welcome to the all-in-one boot floppy. And there's some information on the screen. It was created by Michael uh, Sherl, Michael Sherl. Not sure how to pronounce your last name, Michael, but I remember using this back in the day for this exact purpose, to be able to boot CDs off of um, older PCs that didn't have the capability built into the BIOS to boot off of a uh, CD. And so I've used this, oh, I don't know, a long time ago. I mean, it was obviously sometime in the 2000s was the last time I used this. Still available on the internet and super, super useful tool. So it says press any key, we'll do that. And as you can see, there are tons of things that you can do with this. So you can reset your keyboard configuration, uh, load Smart Boot Manager, so you, that'll allow us to boot from the CD without having that capability in the BIOS. And there's also here Load Free DOS with lots of extra tools. And I think that's where the, uh, uh, the capability to read an NTFS partition lies. So we'll check that out. And there's also some memory testers and some other things. So let's go ahead and load up FreeDOS. 
And here we go. Here's our available utilities. And the one that I'm interested in, there's FDISC, of course, uh, CD burn-in tests, some different things here. The one I'm interested in is NTFS DOS, which can help access NTFS partitions in read-only mode. So we'll type in NTFS DOS. See what happens. Okay, and it did say mounting NTFS partitions as drive D. So we should have access to that now. Let's just go ahead and check it out. Yep, and sure enough, we do have access. Now I can tell you right away that it doesn't look like there's anything too interesting on here. See the Windows directories, Windows NT, um, and the, uh, it's probably Windows 32 for legacy stuff there. Um, uh, programs, my music, my downloads, i386, that may be a driver or something. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, oh, and up here there's uh, probably, this is America Online. It says Americ. That's probably America Online. Uh, so what is Morphous? Oh yeah, this was a full featured peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application. I remember this. So this was back in the days of uh, file sharing and Napster and things like that, I believe. Um, who remembers using Morpheus back in the day? And here's what Morpheus used to look like if it jogs your memory. But I remember using all sorts of file sharing applications like this. Uh, Morpheus was just one. There was uh, BearShare and Napster, of course, and a bunch of other ones, but I'm assuming that's what this is. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool. So now I want to go ahead and do the Load Smart Boot Manager and see if this will boot the CD up. Where do I want to boot from? I want to boot from CD-ROM. Well, there we go. Okay, now Cor Tiny Core OS, or Core OS in this case, because I wanted something really, really small that would run in 16 megabytes of memory, is loaded and I've mounted the old hard drive as an NTF uh, um, uh, file system on uh, the system here under slash mount. So I should be able to do LS and see what's there. And sure enough, now with a more modern operating system running, we can see that has long file name support we can see exactly what those files were that we couldn't really see before. And sure enough, America Online uh, 6.0 is listed here. We can see things like autoexec bat and uh, config.sys. So the things that we couldn't see before are like Microsoft Office, Microsoft Visual Studio, um, Windows Media Player. There's a Windows NT uh, folder inside of program files. That's kind of interesting. Uh, NetMeeting is in here. Who remembers NetMeeting? Um, so yeah, again, oh, Microsoft front page as well. So it looks like the full suite of Microsoft uh, Office applications is in here. But yeah, nothing really um, too exciting or interesting. P certainly nothing that would need to be backed up to Internet Archive or anything like that. All right, well, now I want to try a graphical environment, Linux environment, and I'm going to be booting something called Dam Small Linux. Yes, that's a Dam Small Linux or DSL. And I just want to see if I can get to some sort of a, a GUI here. Uh, in Linux on this old PC and see if maybe we can test out this uh, Creative Lab sound card, which I uh, have it reinstalled at this point as well. So here's damn small Linux running um, on this hardware. And uh, yeah, at least we can see that we can get a Linux desktop on this thing, which is really nice. They've got some little tips here for starting, uh, for people that are getting started for how to use this. Um, it's not, I, lo I love to see the little performance indicators over here. You can see we're only using um, 14 meg out of the 60 or so that I have currently installed. I've been messing around with the, uh, the memory settings and configuration. Uh, but you can see how much is used. The file system is actually loaded into memory. So um, yeah, you don't need to do anything with the hard drive. It just runs off the live CD. Um, the other nice thing about this is you can actually mount various file systems. So that hard drive that we were playing with before, if we wanted to mount that, we could and take a look at those files. Here you can see it's uh, offering us uh, to mount the floppy, the CD-ROM, or the first hard disk that it sees. We can just go ahead and mount the floppy. Okay, now it's mounted. And I've made some changes to the... Um, hard drive as well, but I can see all the files there um, on the uh, on the hard drive. I just wanted to show that these old, uh, there are small um, memory footprint Linux live CDs that you can run and get access to some of these files if you needed to do that. But now let's go ahead and load Windows 98 on this hard drive. And I was kind of hoping that there would be some um, 
drivers already configured to run the uh, uh, sound blaster so I could test the sound. But when they make these really miniature operating systems, Linux operating systems, they strip out a lot of drivers and things that aren't necessary so they don't have to load those into memory. So this does not have support for the sound card, unfortunately, but it's kind of to be expected. And there we go, the familiar Windows 98 startup sound, of course. So uh, this is working. They chose Windows 98 to replace the um, Windows 2000 install that was on here. Obviously, I couldn't get into that. But uh, I chose Windows 98 because everything on this board is either uh, made in 95 or 96. All the date codes and things are mostly 95. The Intel uh, Pentium 200 MMX processor that's running in here was released in 1997. So it just made sense. If someone got this, they probably put Windows 95 on it, but I'm sure that with a with an upgraded processor like this, 200 megahertz processor, this would have been perfect for Windows 98. And I always like running the period uh, operating system that would have been running on the machines that I run. Everything seems to run a little bit better that way. Things aren't slowed down. Um, and uh, yeah, it just makes a really good Windows 98 machine. Now the eagle-eyed among you will notice that this is not the card that came uh, that I showed earlier that I found inside this busted uh, uh, case that I found at e-waste. Um, that is sitting over here and that is because this particular card, unfortunately, uh, when I was uh, loading up Windows 98 and trying to get this to work, I noticed that the main uh, IC here, uh, this Creative Labs IC, was getting really, really hot. So there's some sort of short on this board somewhere. It could be one of the electrolytic capacitors over here. Um, it could be lots of different things, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Don't have time to troubleshoot it right now. It's unfortunate that this didn't work out of the box, but that's what happens sometimes. So what I did was I went into my pile and pulled out a Sound Blaster 16, which is also a extended ISA, 16-bit uh, ISA slot card, and got that installed. And as you can see, it is, or here, it is working just fine. Okay, well, this is Aaron from the future. Uh, so after I got done with this video, I thought, you know, I really should try to fix that Sound Blaster card if I can. But I did a little research, and it turns out that on this card, this main chip here does get hot on its own. So that may have not indicated a short or a bad problem. So then what I thought was, well, since the sound on this, I know I didn't show it, um, uh, I kind of skipped over it, but the sound that was coming out of this card was a lot of static. And uh, sometimes when I did play a sound, it would be all distorted. So what I did was um, I went ahead and replaced all of the capacitors on this side of the board um, because I figured the problem is either bad capacitors or a bad amplifier. And there's a little chip down in here, a little IC. This is an amplifier chip. I've got some of those on order too, but I figured, you know what? It would be a shame if this was just capacitors not to at least try to fix this. So I took an hour or so, um, desoldered these caps, which were not easy to get out because this is a multi-layer board. So the ground plane uh, was really not helping me out here, but I got them all out, changed them because I had these capacitors on hand. So let's plug in this board and maybe it'll actually work with these new capacitors. Powering on, ready to pair. All right, well, no sound yet. And that's not a surprise because I had to install the Sound Blaster 16 drivers. Um, and so there's not even a speaker icon right now. So now what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and uninstall um, those old drivers for that other card. And then I'll do a search for this new component uh, here, uh, the old add new hardware wizard, and see if it will recognize it. Okay, it finished installing the drivers, or what it found anyway, which it did find an AW32 card. So let's go ahead and restart and see if we get any sound out of this. Come on, baby. Fingers crossed. I can't cross my fingers anymore. Too many surgeries on my hand. There we go. Fingers crossed. Come on. Oh, there it goes. Hey, there we go. I'm glad I went back and did this repair. Awesome. That's sounding great. And all it was was those capacitors. I'm glad that's all it was. Yeah, the chip is, is yeah, pretty hot. I can't hold my finger on there for more than 10 or uh, uh, 15 seconds or so. 
but I guess that's just how it runs. So that kind of threw me off. So there we go. Now back to the regularly scheduled programming. And I think to play this out, we need a classic MIDI file from this era, which my favorite is Canyon. I still like to listen to this even to this day. Here we go. I just like going in and messing with this stuff. In fact, I was just doing this in my spare time. I wasn't even going to make a video about it. But, uh, you know, I thought as I was going through, why not show uh, what some of the stuff that you can find um, salvageable at e-waste, even in a case that was badly beat up and had duct tape all over it. Opening it up really found some treasures. Um, so I was really glad to find that. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll stick this in a case later on if I have a Windows 98 build that I want to run. Uh, one other interesting uh, quirk that I found is that the Diamond Stealth, uh, by default, using the Windows 98 drivers that, uh, uh, did, when it detected the card, it installed the default drivers. And using those drivers, I was not able to get it to do anything above 800 by 600 resolution. So I'm not sure if this card actually supported it or not, but uh, that's all that I was able to get out of it. So perhaps I need to find a different driver. I don't know. Or maybe I'm just used to running those higher resolutions now. And, uh, you know, that's that's just my expectation is that I'll be able to do a higher resolution mode. But this is 800 by 600. That's what I used back in the day during the Windows 98 period. So, uh, yeah, maybe that's good enough. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a thumbs up and uh, please subscribe if you haven't done that. I got a big boost in subscribers oh, yeah. recently. So, uh, oh, just in time, the speaker ran out of battery just as the song ended. You can't beat that. But uh, yeah, if you subscribed recently, thank you very much and welcome to the channel. I'm glad to see all of the new viewers. Um, and thanks, of course, to my patrons whose, whose information will be on the credits at the end of the episode. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for now. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary and, of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.